Hello everyone, and welcome to the Decision Webinar, Pinterest 2015, Pin Down a Winning PR Strategy. I'm Stacey Miller, Senior Social and Media Relations Manager, and your moderator for today. During today's webinar with Jennifer Cariel, we're going to learn how to earn coverage using insights found in reporters' feeds, rank higher in search by optimizing for Pinterest's algorithm, grow your audience as an early adopter of its latest features and ads, and leverage partnerships to launch new products and more. Before I introduce Jennifer, we have a few brief housekeeping points. There will be a moderated Q&A at the end of the webinar, so feel free to use the chat box on your webinar panel to submit those anytime throughout the webinar today. If you would like a copy of the slides, they will be posted to Cision.com and SlideShare after today's webinar. A full recording of the webinar will also be available on Cision.com. If you are on Twitter today and want to tweet about the webinar, please use the Cision Webinar hashtag. That's all one word, Cision Webinar. The top hashtag Cision Webinar tweets are going to receive a Cision prize back in the mail, and we will be revealing those winners on Twitter shortly after the webinar. And now I'll introduce our speaker. Jennifer Cario is the founder of boutique marketing firm Sugar Spun Marketing and author of Pinterest Marketing, An Hour a Day. An industry leader in content-driven social media strategies, Jennifer also serves as social media faculty chair for Market Motive, a premier online training facility. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Jennifer. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'll add my own uh, Twitter handles into the mix in case anyone is tweeting the webinar. Uh, my personal one is Jennifer Cario, though I am more active on Sugarspun MKT for Sugarspun Marketing. So with that said, let's go ahead and get going because I have a lot of information to cover today. Um, real quick though, just in case we do have anyone on the call that is kind of new to Pinterest or the Pinterest world, we do want to give a little bit of an oversight of sort of what it is and why it's something that we're also concerned with. So in case you've been living under a rock in the uh, social media world, Pinterest is basically a web-based inspiration board. So if you think about that old file folder that maybe your mom or your grandma maybe had tucked into their junk drawer somewhere that was full of recipe clippings or things they cut out of magazines that were ideas they liked, it's basically taking that idea and moving it into a web-based visual environment where you can also connect and share those ideas with other people. So if you think about the bookmarks that you used to always forever be adding to you know, Firefox or Internet Explorer, you ended up with these great big huge lists of just text. And actually going back in and finding what you had originally saved was not only difficult, but it usually didn't even happen because again, you look at that list and you go, well, I don't even remember what half of those things were. Moving it into a visual bookmarking category like we have with Pinterest makes it so much easier for people to really at a glance go in, glance through everything they have in there, and look for exactly what they wanted to find because the recall that we have on images is so much higher. Now we're also seeing a big change happen in terms of how people are searching for content online. So back before Pinterest, your primary option was to go to Google, run a search, start reading through all the search listings and make decisions to say, okay, well that one sounds like it might be good, so I'll click through and I'll look at, oh no, that's awful. Okay, I'm going to go back to Google and try the next one on the list, or I'm going to try a completely new search. Now in the world where we have Pinterest and we go and run searches there, our searches are not only visual, but they also give us a great indication of how relevant that result is to what we're looking for because we can visually see exactly what's happened. We can read the description that this is a computer-generated description, but it's always a curated description by a person. And we can get an idea of how popular it is by looking at how many repins and how many likes. So it gives us a very different set of information to work from when we're trying to decide what type of content we want to reach. So it's really pushing Pinterest into one of those heavy areas of being a discovery engine, very similar to how we may have used Google in the past. Now, one last one to sort of give you a little bit of context or comparison because nearly everyone in the world at this point is familiar with Facebook. So when we make a comparison of Facebook to Pinterest, we see that there is a very distinct difference in time on site. We're looking at an average of 7 hours a month on Facebook and an average of 90 minutes a month on Pinterest. But there's some good reason for that difference, and it shouldn't necessarily make you think that Pinterest is used that much less. Because the thing that you want to remember is that Facebook is viewed as a destination. It's the place that you go to connect with your friends, to connect with colleagues, to find out what's going on in life. 
Pinterest, on the other hand, like Google, is viewed as a starting point. It's not the place you go and stay. You go there and you click off and you go to another site. And then you come back when you're ready to look for the next site or the next place you want to visit. So while Facebook is a conversation and a sharing platform, Pinterest really is more of a collection and an inspiration platform. Now the other key difference that we see here from the business perspective and from the marketing and PR side is that Facebook has a limited depth of content. You can only put so much content out on Facebook before you actually risk damaging your reach. If you're familiar at all with the idea of Facebook's newsfeed algorithm, you know that the more content you put out that people don't directly engage with, the less often you're going to show up on Facebook. Now Pinterest, on the other hand, gives you an unlimited depth of content. If you want to pin 75 different pictures of, I don't know, classic checker cabs from New York City, you can do that. You can never share that many pictures on Facebook without running the risk of isolating your audience, you know, kind of bothering them. But on Pinterest, you can go as deep as you want into any topic because people have much different levels of control over which parts of your content they receive. So Facebook is really what we look at in terms of engaging with our fans. Pinterest is really a place that is wonderful for attracting fans and for researching targets, people that maybe are popular bloggers or influential journalists that we want to learn a little bit more about. So moving on to a couple of other misconceptions that people have, because one of the biggest ones is still the idea that Pinterest is all about weddings. It's just weddings and weddings and weddings with maybe a little healthy dose of food and fashion kicked into the mix. And you know, there's a few men lurking here and there that don't want to admit that they're there. But the reality is that in the last year, throughout 2014, we saw a lot of changes happen in the demographics. Pinterest went from being a place that was roughly 93% female users in the first couple of years that they, uh, they popped up to now being 71% female and 29% male. And in fact, 13% of all men that are Internet users are now using Pinterest. Now, those numbers continue to rise over time. Um, in fact, the number of men on Pinterest doubled this past year. Now, if you're outside of the United States, it's risen at a faster rate than that. But again, we are seeing men start to come into the mix. And I imagine we'll probably see it balance out somewhere closer to 60-40. I don't think we're ever going to see an even 50-50 mix. It's common on the social media channels to have one that's you know, maybe a little more dominant with one gender than the other. But I think we're going to see it balance out here in the next year with a nice mix of men that's still predominantly populated by females. Now a couple other stats about them, 64% of Pinterest users make in excess of $50,000 a year. 75% are non-urban, so they're either rural or living in the suburbs, but not city dwellers. And they have roughly 70 million active users as of the end of 2014. So again, we're reaching really nice uh, numbers in terms of volume and in terms of sort of penetration into the overall Internet user market. Sorry, I had a slight issue there. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, men are now accounting for 33% of all new signups outside of the U.S. That's over half of all new signups. And overall, you know, in the United States and other countries, they experienced a 73% year-over-year growth. Now, more men are visiting Pinterest each month than reading Sports Illustrated and GQ combined. So again, when we look at the potential reach, and who we can get out in front of when we're on Pinterest, it is important to remember that we are seeing those numbers balanced, and it's not just a place anymore to only go after females. Now when we look at some of the traffic potential that's coming in from Pinterest, the average pin drives two visits and six page views to a website, and is worth roughly 78 cents in sales. Now the average pin also receives 11 repins, so for those of you who are big Twitter users, the average pin is roughly 100 times more viral than the average tweet. So again, there's a lot more potential to really get out there and get your message to spread farther and faster. Now there's also a latent effect that comes in with the traffic on Pinterest. Because if you think about how you personally might use Pinterest, a lot of times you're pinning something, and then you may go back and engage with it at a later date and not even click through it until a couple months down the road. You know, maybe you're planning a vacation, maybe you're planning a wedding, maybe you're doing some research on what motorcycle you're going to buy. But roughly half of the traffic that comes into websites occurs three months after 
that initial pin gets released into the Pinterest universe, and about half of product orders occur roughly two months after, which again makes sense when you think about people using it to build birthday lists, Christmas lists, uh, gift ideas. So again, just because you see a lot of pin activity happening and no traffic to be paired with it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get that latent traffic effect down the road. Now one other thing I want to mention before we hit the e-commerce side, because I do hear this a lot from companies that are really concerned about getting on Pinterest and really getting out there with great content. Uh, we remember the same thing happened, what, 10 years ago when we were trying to get companies to bring blogs into the mix. It was, well, if I tell them more about it or I tell them how to do it, they're not going to buy it from me anymore. And if you've ever visited any of the Pinterest sales sites, you know very, very quickly that while there's a lot of people that are aspirational and dream of creating all these wonderful things they see on the site, a pretty good chunk of them are not going to have the same success as the original blogger or as the original content creator. So it's a great reminder that Pinterest becomes the place to inspire people, to make them realize that there's more out there or more ways to do things than what they might have already thought of. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not still going to come to you to purchase that solution or you know, to purchase the input on that solution. So when we look at things from the e-commerce side, um, looking at some data that uh, was put together in 2014, roughly 47% of online shoppers have made a purchase that's based on a Pinterest recommendation. And in fact, Pinterest grabs 41% of e-commerce social sharing. Now, they don't beat Facebook out in overall social sharing, but when we're talking about e-commerce social sharing, they're pulling 41% and Facebook is only pulling 37%. So again, when we're looking at actual products that are uh, customers and our clients are looking to push, we're going to see a lot bigger level of social sharing driving that purchasing behavior on Pinterest than what we're going to see on Facebook. When we look at the average breakdown in uh, purchase price coming off of the top three sites, off of Pinterest, we've got an average purchase price of $179. Off of Facebook, it's $80, and off of Twitter, it's $69. So with Pinterest, we're talking roughly 27% more revenue per click than what's coming in from Facebook, and roughly 400% more revenue per click than what's coming in off of Twitter. And it's really important to remember that a huge part of that is because of the mindset that people tend to be in when they're on Pinterest. When you're on Facebook, you tend to be connecting with friends and family. Yeah, you're looking for some personal recommendations, or you might be open to an ad that pops up in front of you, but you're sort of in conversation and connection mode. And for most of us when we're on Twitter, it's really about seeing what the news of the day is, finding some links, discovering some resources, and sort of you know, broadening our, our knowledge base for the day. But on Pinterest, we're in that mindset of let's collect it all. You know, it's like every commercial you ever heard for a kid's toy ever. You know, go out and collect them all. And it builds that mindset of, oh, I want this. I desire this. And so they're much more prepped and ready when they actually do come into your site to make a purchase. And then when you also consider some of the higher end things that people are taking time to research on Pinterest, whether that's a you know, really high end wedding dress or maybe their engagement ring or you know, maybe the living room furniture or the bedroom set that they're looking at buying or a car or whatever, all of these tend to be higher ticket price items. So that's going to lead to a much higher overall impact in terms of the dollar value coming in. Okay, so moving into the idea of the Pinterest smart feed. Now, I've been following Pinterest pretty much since it launched and reporting on it, and I have to say I was kind of excited when they finally did get, a, get around to producing an algorithm. Um, as a former SEO, I'm a little frustrated that it's kind of hard to reverse engineer this algorithm, but nonetheless, at least we are starting to see them move into the realm where they're trying to do some matching, and they're trying to really create better quality content for the people coming into Pinterest. So if you've been a Pinterest user for a while, you probably remember the days that you would log in, you would look at your home feed, and there would be 50 million pins on the exact same topic just absolutely flooding your feed. So in this case here, someone was clearly in an inspirational sayings kick. Now, if you log into your Pinterest feed today, what you're going to see is a much more eclectic list of different styles of content. That's because the original Pinterest feed, your news feed, like your homepage on Pinterest, basically just showed chronological pinning from all the people that you had chosen to follow and all the boards that you had subscribed to. So if someone happened to be, again, on a kick and pinning a ton of content into a particular board, they were going to completely flood out your feed. 
Now, what Pinterest is looking to do at this point is to create a much more natural mix of content that they believe you're going to be interested in looking at. So there's a couple different things that they've factored into their new algorithm. The first is the idea that they want different sources of pins mixed up at different rates. So some of that's going to mean different pinners, and some of it's going to mean different destinations. So again, if I log on, and someone that I follow has just pinned 27 white couches because they're trying to figure out what white couch they want to buy for their living room. Pinterest is no longer going to show me all 27 of those couches. They're going to make a judgment call about the original source of the pen, the website that it's going to land on, and how people have reacted to each of those individual pins. And much like Facebook does in their newsfeed algorithm, the pins that are getting more activity, more repins, more likes, more comments, more clicks, those are the pins that it's going to prioritize, and it's going to choose a handful of them, and it's going to insert that into my newsfeed. And the other ones, it's going to set aside and hold for later, and either give to me at a later point, or just not even show to me at all. So what it's looking to do is have that understanding that some pins should be shown now, but other pins need to be shown later. And again, a portion of those are going to filter in over the next couple of days, but a portion of them probably are not going to show at all. So if you could look at your current home feed and you could see the date on each of those pins, you'd find that some of them might have happened in the last five minutes, but some of them might have happened two or three or five days ago if you haven't logged in for a little while. Now there's also the idea that different pins have different value based on what your Pinterest activity has been, you know, based on how you interact with content. So unfortunately, I've got a slide overlap here, and I apologize for that. But the example here was I've been doing a ton of pinning lately for a big event that we're working on planning. It's going to include life-size board games. So the example that's covered up is a really great visual uh, piece of content of a giant Scrabble board that someone built in their backyard. And then the one on the top is the one that they're probably not going to show to me because it's really just sort of a big board game. It's not a life-size board game. And just the image itself and the description itself doesn't have as much interest. So again, they're going to try and make a judgment call. And what I'll see out of those two pins versus what someone else might see out of those two pins is going to be based on how we've interacted with the site over time. So a couple things that you want to keep in mind for Pinterest now are really the same thing that most of us have been telling you to do all along anyways, which boils down to the idea of really producing great content. So you want to make sure that you've got an easy to understand visual. And I don't know about the rest of you, but hopefully you've moved into the realm where you have a graphic designer or a graphic artist that is working on a Pinterest-friendly image for every blog post that's going on your site. Because if you can make that lead-in image really great and ready for Pinterest and has your watermark and has your text description on it, you're going to have a lot better chance to really pull long-term traffic out of it once it gets into the site. Now you also want to make sure that leads to a good website. So again, if your site is the type of site that has good content that people click through to, they spend time on, that's going to dramatically increase the chances that Pinterest is going to put value on it. Because much like Google, they know which sites people click into and they can make the judgment call and tell how long do they spend there before they hit that back button and return. Now you also want to make sure you've got some keyword rich descriptive text that's sort of going in as your default entry for anything that's going up from your site. Of course, keep in mind plenty of people are going to edit those and change them to make it their own. And then finally, they're going to be looking for that high volume of pin and like activity. So we can see our example here has 3,900 repins and 351 likes. It's clearly a good quality piece of content. Pinterest is likely going to rank it much higher than the other pin someone puts up right after this that just has a picture of an apple and says, you know, here's a healthy kid snack and doesn't have any repins. Again, they're going to look to see what the history of the pin is. Okay, so why Pinterest matters to PR? Because this is really sort of the meat of what we want to talk about today. Because there's several different ways in which we can really leverage Pinterest well on the PR front. Now the first and most obvious one is the potential for traffic. So when we look at the top sources of traffic coming in, and this is from uh, Q4 of last year, Pinterest still ranks number two behind Facebook. Now it's a long ways behind Facebook, but then once you go from Pinterest down to Twitter, we see another big jump. And in fact, if we add Twitter and StumbleUpon and Reddit and Google Plus and LinkedIn and YouTube all together, we still don't quite hit the numbers that we see coming in from Pinterest. So if you rely on social media as a huge part of your traffic sources, Pinterest should really be second only to Facebook 
in terms of the time and effort and dedication that you put into really making an impact there. It really has a strong likelihood of sending good quality traffic into your site. Now, if we look at how things have changed over the last few years, so if we look at sort of the end of year average from 2011 to 2014, we can see that Facebook and Pinterest are the only two social media channels that have experienced growth in terms of their social media referrals, in terms of the traffic coming off of them. So we're seeing Twitter and StumbleUpon and Reddit, Google+, all of those are having some slight de decline over time. Pinterest and Facebook are the only ones growing. So again, traffic-wise, super, super important. Now, another reason that there's a lot of value to keep tabs on Pinterest is the idea of trend watching, checking to see what's going on. So for example, if you've been on Pinterest for a couple years, you probably were not surprised when every single wedding you got invited to last year was in a barn or next to a barn or somehow rustic or every craft that you saw people talking about or every homemade gift that you got from someone was made out of mason jars. Because if you're on Pinterest, you would see that those things started to flood the world. Just like coming into 2015, we know that metrosexuals have been replaced with lumbersexuals. And it's all about the beard and the flannel and looking like a tough guy even if you sit behind an office desk every single day. So getting into Pinterest and spending the time to connect with your target audience to follow them, to follow the influencers. That makes it much easier to start to see those trends come into play because you'll start to notice them popping up more often in your newsfeed. Even as a parent, it was really, really obvious to me when the idea of, say, the Minecraft birthday party went out the window and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle birthday parties came back in because I started seeing a million do-it-yourself Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle parties pop up. You know, on pretty much every front of life that I'm on Pinterest, you can see here's what the next big trend is going to be. Here's how you know, coconut oil and cauliflower are going to be the two big ingredients that pop up. And sure enough, we saw them everywhere last year. So taking the time to identify the influencers for your target market, and if you're working with multiple clients, making sure that you've got multiple accounts set up for each of those clients, and you're filling them with the type of people that are going to produce content that has a high level of value, to the people you're trying to reach, it's going to be a great way to help you see what's happening. Because when you're aware of that type of content, you have the ability to act on it. So for example, this time last year when I walked into Michael's because I have three kids in elementary school and you, know, you can't possibly just go buy Valentine's cards anymore, you have to make them now. So when I walked into Michael's, sure enough, the first thing I saw was a huge display that had the little bits and pieces I needed from pretty much every idea that I had pinned to my Pinterest boards. Because clearly the Michael's team was scanning the Pinterest boards and seeing, okay, what are people using? You know, what type of erasers or you know, what's the little bubble wand that they're putting in there? And they had everything nice and neat and together in one place for me. And it made my life really simple. And the only thing they could have done better it would have been very easy for them to have built Pinterest boards where they had all of those ideas stored and they didn't, I checked just for the record. And they could have thrown up you know, a big ad right on top of that display and said, you know, come to our Pinterest boards you know, for inspiration on how to use these. And they could have thrown a QR code on it and I could have stood right there in the store, gone through all those ideas and figured out exactly what I wanted to buy. Now for me it wasn't an issue because I came in already knowing. But it was a great example of how doing that trend watching gives you the ability to present that face to your target audience that really matches up with what they're likely to be interested in. Um, and on the tail end of that, as I was doing some searches, I also found myself really wishing that I sold rain barrels. So if any of you on here sell rain barrels, here's a freebie for you. Because as I was running searches for rain barrels, it was fascinating to me how many listings had painted rain barrels. I didn't even know that this was a thing. But apparently this is a thing. If you're putting rain barrels in your yard, especially if you're like an urban gardener, you paint them so that they look beautiful. And I thought, wow, there's so much social media potential there to run contests or to partner with a local artist and you know, run a little like tutorial type shop where people can come in and buy the rain barrels and learn how to paint them. There's a lot of opportunity for really great event marketing or outreach marketing or contest marketing because of these things that you stop and see when you're running searches through Pinterest that you might not think of on your own in everyday life. Now another side of this is the idea of looking at how people take the content that you've produced on your site and basically co-opt it into another idea. So you can see the example picture there 
we had a test blog that we were running about two years ago when we were doing a bunch of, of uh, testing on Pinterest. And we put up a do-it-yourself article on how to build a fake prop wall to use for your wedding. That's when photo booths were becoming really popular. And we expected it to do well, and it did. It got like tens of thousands of pins. But it wasn't until I went in and looked at all the different pins that were being made off of that content that I started to see this content being pinned in the boards, titled things like Smith Family Reunion and Seneca High Senior Prom and SBMU Conference Fund and VFD Fundraiser. And I went, oh, wow, that was so short-sighted of me because I put this content together with a wedding spin. Knowing now that people were co-opting it and saying, well, I could use that for a birthday party or I could use it for my family reunion. It would be very easy for me to take that same prop wall that I still have, reshoot the pictures with different people, rewrite the content, and to release five, six, or maybe even a dozen more versions of that article over the span of the next year to 18 months that targeted each of those different audiences. Because Pinterest is telling me that this is ways they're using my content. And so that tells me that there's gaps in how I'm presenting my content and how I'm telling my story that I could be going back and doing a better job with. So great opportunity just with, again, looking through board titles as people pin your content. So moving into the idea of outreach and pitch research. There are certain industries where Pinterest can be really, really effective for this. There are other in industries where I will be brutally honest with you, it's just it's not happening yet because we don't see a high enough adoption rate across the board. So just keep that in the back of your head and think about you know, what, type of, uh, what type of verticals that you operate in to see how much value this next part gives to you. So when we look at doing research online for the people that we want to pitch, we're trying to figure out the best way to put that pitch together. Clearly the first place that we should be starting is their blog or whatever website they're writing for because that's going to give us an idea of sort of the feel of what they write, what they're interested in. But for a long time now, I hope most of you have been going out and looking them up on other social media channels to try and get some insight and information. So for example, if they've got publicly accessible Facebook or if you're going on their LinkedIn, it's a great opportunity to see who they're connected to. You know, sometimes the best way to get our foot in the door with an influencer is to find out that we have a common connection and to be able to get that introduction. So being able to go through those channels can be really, really handy. Now on Twitter, it's a great way to see who are they interested in? You know, who are they following? Who are they retweeting? What type of news are they talking about? Because that's going to give us some insight. If we're looking at their Instagram account, we're kind of seeing what strikes their fancy. You know, there's not, you can't really have links within a direct Instagram post, so it's a little harder to follow the trail that way, but you can still get that visual of what they care about. Now, Pinterest is where we really see their interests and more than that, their obsessions. Because I mentioned earlier the idea that on Facebook, we can't really dig too awfully deep into a particular topic or category without alienating some of our followers, okay? Because people will say, okay, you can share that one recipe with me because it was really great, but you can't share 27 recipes with me in one day. People are going to unfollow you really, really fast. Pinterest, on the other hand, opens up the door for us to be able to do that because it's not obnoxious to obsess on Pinterest. It's not obnoxious to have one board that has 300 posts on the exact same topic. So it's a great opportunity to go in and see not just what their interests are, but what they really choose to pin a lot of. Because that's going to tell you what their top passion points are and their top trigger points. And it gives you the opportunity to look for those points of commonality to really be able to tailor your pitch in a way that's going to appeal to them. So, if we look at, oh, we've got another slide issue here. Sorry about that one. So if we look at a particular blogger, so I went to, I think this is Pop Sugar Fashion. And you can see the little highlight down there for Samantha Sutton, who is one of the writers there, and does have a Pinterest page. So when I went to her Pinterest page and I looked to see, okay, what is she pinning? There's a lot of fitness pins, but they fall into three very distinct categories. They were all about lazy style exercises or morning workouts or running. So I'm probably not going to want to pitch something that's related to CrossFit to her, but if I'm pitching something you know, that has to do with running, that might be a really great fit. Or if I'm representing someone that does you know, general workout information, I want to come up with a specific piece of content that plays into that idea of either morning workouts or lazy exercises, and I want to pitch that one to her because she's going to be more likely to be interested in it. 
Now, I could also flip through to her hair and makeup boards where all of her hairstyles were long, messy hairstyles. Nothing short, nothing cropped. It's all a very specific type of images. She didn't really have much in the way of, you know, lipstick or foundation or um, contouring, but she had a lot of information on eyeliner type makeup, not even the, the eyeshadow, but, you know, different ways to use your eyeliner and on nail designs. So again, that tells me specific types of information that she's going to be interested in. And then even just random things. She's got tons of posts on um, do-it-yourself shoe art, you know, so taking either your Toms or your Keds and how to decorate those, lots of stuff on do-it-yourself style, and lots of things on interpersonal relationships and people who are introverts. So again, it's a great opportunity to get some of the insight that you wouldn't get necessarily on their blog or on their Facebook feed or even on their Twitter account, but that they're going to dig really deep into on Pinterest. So looking at another example, um, I found a, uh, a guy who writes about classic cars for one of the, uh, I can't remember what magazine it was because we, we had to pull that slide out at the last minute, um, but does a lot of writing about cars. But if you go into his Pinterest feed, you also find that he's really into urban farming and when you look at the specific types of cars, he's into classic cabs, classic Spanish cab or Spanish cars, and something called a Taltra that I've never heard of. But tons and tons and tons of pictures of those. So again, it's the opportunity to see what is it that has appeal to these people, and how can we formulate a pitch, especially if this is like you know, a gold level standard of person that you know if you just get one person to cover that particular story, you know it's going to spread out from there you have the opportunity to do the research so that you're creating the story specifically for them. Now, another thing I want to mention that's a great, great, great one in this whole box for PR professionals is Pinterest secret boards. So if you're not using secret boards yet, this is definitely something you want to look into, especially in terms of team collaboration. You can have an unlimited amount of these, and they're a board that can only be seen by the person who sets it up and anyone that they invite to see it. So maybe this is your place where you're keeping secret lists of articles and sources that you might want to refer back to but that you don't necessarily want anyone else to know that you're keeping tabs on. Maybe it's where you're making quotes and images and links available internally to the rest of the people on your team so that they've got one common source that they can go to to grab a piece of content you know, and send it out. Because it might not all be internal content. You can also pin other pieces of content and add your commentary. You know, what if we changed this up and you know, did it in this new way? And you can put it in there. It's also great for storing ideas for upcoming events or outreach and collectively strategizing for a potential client. Let's say you're getting ready to pitch a new client and you want to have your team have some place where they can pull together maybe case studies, examples, you know, all sorts of different ideas so that everyone can go in and sort of look at it and check to see what's available and what's online. Now, we use secret boards. We primarily only use them for things like event planning and some client outreach. So event planning-wise, I mentioned earlier we're working on a huge fundraiser right now that has life-size Monopoly and life-size Candyland. But then we'll also use it to keep ideas for down the road. You know, we'll have a ladies' night out event, looked at uh, doing a cardboard box city to get some youth involved. But this is a place where we store our ideas and then once we're actually ready to launch them to the public, that's great if they get transferred into other boards. But I don't necessarily want everyone else to know what I'm planning for my next big gala because I want it to be unique and interesting. So wonderful opportunity to get a team together when you're working on in-person event planning. And then we also use it for outreach ideas. Uh, we tend to send random packages to our clients every now and then, um, anything from overnighting them, you know, homemade ice cream to uh, cinnamon rolls or whatever other fun things we can come up with just because it's part of how we keep an interesting connection with our clients. So having some place where we can collect all of these different ideas and have them available for our team to look at is a wonderful way to utilize the secret boards. Now, there's also the idea of using Pinterest to tell your story. And this is probably one of the first ways that people really figured out how to leverage Pinterest on the PR front. But sometimes it's about letting your story connect with other stories to make it stronger. Sometimes it's about sharing existing stories with people. And sometimes it's just using things as sort of a launch point. So when we look at it from the idea of using your own story to connect, um, Southwest had a board that they put up this year that was basically Elf on Board. And it was a bunch of pictures of the Elf on the Shelf in their airplane. Now, the disappointing thing to me was that that board had like 
oh, I don't know, I think it was 90 or 100,000 followers because people are obsessed with Elf on the Shelf right now. But they didn't do anything to tie it into the broader Pinterest community. They didn't make a contest out of it. You know, they really kind of missed an opportunity there because they were telling their story of here's this elf that we have showing up on random flights, but they could have very easily added pictures of kids discovering it or had a contest that, you know, if your child or if you find it, here's what you get. And they really could have looked at the story side of Pinterest and really the Internet as a whole and connected those things together. Because if you go to Pinterest and you run a search for elf on the shelf, you're going to find no shortage of content. Sometimes it's also just about being part of your target audience's story. So I was working with the consortium of law schools um, last year, and we were doing a lot of work on their Pinterest boards where it was things like the law school humor that their students are pinning, making sure that we have boards that have that. And even in some of the schools, taking some of these pieces of humor that we find and actually posting them in random places around the school, like the library or the study lounges, and again, having that QR code or that call to action to get people to come in and connect with the Pinterest boards. Same things at graduation time where we curated a whole board full of unique graduation gifts or unique um, law school graduation announcements. It's becoming part of the story of your target audience and realizing that on Pinterest, you don't have to create all those ideas yourself because you can curate what other people are doing. And simply by curating it, you can really create and offer something of value for other people. And then finally, using your stories to sell a product. And Chobani has really been one of the great companies from the start of Pinterest to really embrace Pinterest at its core and understand you know, how they can use it to really spread that story. So Chobani, almost from the start, has been reaching out to bloggers and popular pinners and saying, hey, we're going to send you the new flavors of our Chobani yogurt and we would love you to develop some recipes. And they just have tons and tons of boards that are full of content that third parties have created, recipes that have been created, you know, ideas and tips that have been created by other people, but that all help promote the product and give people a reason to say, oh, Chobani might not just be the thing that I eat for breakfast. Here's all the other ways I can use it, and therefore I can do what? I can buy more Chobani, which is in their best interest. So again, sometimes it's using that as sort of your clearinghouse of where all that content comes together. Now the final one I have on this before we move into the next section is there's a, you'll find a lot of things online talking about the idea of using Pinterest sort of as your image storehouse. So people will say, you know, it's a great place to put up a board where you have all the versions of your logo that can properly be used or all the different case studies that you want to share with people. And, you know, it's all about putting the pictures up. And I'll be honest and say that from my perspective, I don't think using Pinterest as just a photo album online is really kind of hitting the mark of how people use Pinterest. I think it's a little short-sighted. I don't think it's necessarily going to hurt you to do that, but I think there are better sources out there, including your own website, to house you know, all the different versions of your logo and everything else that you want to put up. So this one really comes just down to you know, an internal decision of how you want to use it. It's an option. It's just not something that I think is worth as much time as most of the other things that we've mentioned. Okay, so moving into the realm of paid Pinterest outreach and partnerships, and then we're going to kind of wrap up with Pinterest new promoted pins, and then uh, we should still have some time for some Q&A at the end. So I'm sure most of you are aware that as with any place that has popular people, people are getting paid to do things. It's inevitable. It's just going to happen. Now, Pinterest did finally put some terms of service up about this idea, um, either in late 2013 or early 2014. And basically, what they've said is twofold. There's the idea that they don't mind if a, if a business pays someone to put together a board that represents their, their brand. So this, like similar to having a guest blogger, but you would have a guest pinner. They're also okay with people earning money from an affiliate network. You know, so if I pin this product and someone buys it, I make money from that. What they don't want to have happen is a blogger be paid to pin. Now, that still happens. It happens all of the time, and there's probably a great deal of people on the call who have done that. As with everything else in the world of social media, you have to keep in mind the risk-reward scenario. Pinterest has cut out accounts for people that they have caught doing this, and they have stated that it's against their terms of service. So if you do that, you have to accept that you're taking a risk, and you have to decide if you're okay with that risk. Now, there are some other ways to sort of take advantage of 
paying to have people involved with your Pinterest that fall a little more in line with what Pinterest is okay with. Now, one of those is the idea of these Pinterest high influencer networks that are popping up. So Hello Society is one of the big ones. And basically, yes, Pinterest users have agents. And the really interesting thing about this is a lot of the really popular pinners, we're talking to people that have you know, two, three, four million followers, they're not also really popular bloggers. Like you can go look at their Twitter account and they might have 500 Twitter followers. Or you can go look at their blog and there's not really anyone there. Most of the really powerful people on Pinterest are just the people who happen to be early adopters that Pinterest put out as recommended people to follow when everyone else was signing up for Pinterest. So you have a really interesting sort of dichotomy in the world of Pinterest influencers that only a small portion of them are also really heavy influencers in the rest of the social media world. So a lot of them don't really know how to handle or leverage sort of the level of fame they have, and they kind of want to be sort of private about it. But there are some of them that are starting to move into some of these networks that will allow them to connect with people. So what's usually happening through these networks is threefold. There's the idea of content creation, where you might be hiring someone who's a really high-powered pinner to create content for you. Maybe they're developing a recipe for you. Maybe they're doing you know, pictures and photography for you, tutorials, whatever. But they're creating content that they can put up on their network and that you can put out on your network. There's also the idea of amplification, repins and pins of created content coming by network members. Now this one gets a little trickier because technically they can't pay per pin, but you can sort of have someone hired as someone who is part of your pinning team even though they have their own account. So again, you get into murky water there. And then the final is the idea of curation, you know, taking advantage of existing credibility to put together collections or ideas or approaches. So this might be Disney flying a really popular pinner down to Disney World and having them sort of experience Disney World with their family and you know, get a bunch of behind the scenes input where they can take pictures and put them up and they can pin all sorts of related content to that. Or it might be something like what Target did. So Target has long partnered with really well-known designers and celebrities, you know, Isaac Mizrahi and think Paula Deen to create different collections that were sold in their store. Well, last year they partnered with, I think it was four different bloggers to create a curated collection that they would sell in Target stores, but that would also be sort of the inspiration point for content being shared on Pinterest. Now, this is brilliant from Target's perspective because as of the time they started this, they had about 120,000 followers. They're up to about 250,000 followers now. But Joy Cho, one of the Pinterest um, top users that they partnered with, she had 13 million followers. So clearly if you get her pinning for you under her name, that's going to open the door to a lot more content going out there. So what they did is they worked with each of these top Pinterest users and they actually curated and created a whole new collection to be sold in the stores under that person's name, the same way as when they did you know, clothing by Isaac Mizrahi. Now they had party supplies by Joy Cho. So this was a great way to really leverage and create that relationship based off of who they could find as influencers within the Pinterest realm to be able to get their message, their products, and their ideas to spread further into Pinterest. Now moving straight into the Pinterest advertising section. And for those of you who are not part of the, the beta test that went out last year, um, Pinterest has opened their promoted posts feature as of January 1st to everyone. So if you haven't played with it yet, definitely a great idea to get in there and do a little bit of playing around with because it becomes yet another source on social media that we all get to throw money at for additional exposure. So setup is really easy. You log into your account, you go into the promoted posts section, and they're basically going to show you all of the posts that are in your account that are you know, eligible for you to turn into a promoted post. So you're just going to pick the one you want, and very similar to how you set up advertising on Twitter or set up advertising on Facebook, you're going to pick some keywords or some interests. There's some very basic level demographics that you can pick. It's pretty much gender and what type of device they're on, and I think their location, and that's about it. And then you're going to set a start and end date, and you're going to set a daily campaign budget. And you're going to let your ad run, and you're going to see what happens. Now, doing this does not take very long. 
And much like with Facebook, if you're new to this type of advertising, you can play around and do some testing with very small amounts of money, um, you know, $100, even $20 or $50. Again, it's a great way to go in and look and see what happens before you scale it up to a higher level. So I've got a screenshot here of one we just did last week to run a test for a client. Spent $100 over the span of three days. Got 250,000 impressions. That means that pin we know for certain showed up in front of 250,000 people. That's a seven cent CPC. I mean, that's a really, really, really great price. Now, the click through rate on it isn't high, it's only half a percent, but we still got 1.4, yeah, 1.4K clicks for less than $100. 432 repins for less than $100. And to be honest, it really wasn't a you know, highly targeted or put together campaign. This was sort of a let's throw something out there and test it on this one. So we threw an image together real quick and we put it up. You know, there hasn't been any fine tuning going on or anything with this. But the overall results that have been coming in so far have been pretty strong. Now, it's tough to find any really good case studies out there because everyone's still kind of holding their cards close to their chest right now. But Pinterest did release some data towards, um, actually, I think just earlier this month. Um, yeah, this was reasonably fresh data that I pulled up. And they said basically the average organic pin is repinned 11 times, and the average paid pin is outperforming that, which is good because, again, it's targeted. You're putting it out in front of specific people. The biggest benefit from my perspective is that there's no cost for your impressions. You're only paying for clicks. So on average, Pinterest reports that people are seeing a 30% increase in earned media after they're running these ads or while they're running these ads. That's a pretty nice increase in eyeballs without directly paying for it. And then I mentioned earlier the idea of the latent impact that we see happening with traffic on Pinterest, and we see that happening with the ads as well. So an average of a 5% increase in earned media in the month after someone runs a campaign. Because again, remember those pins are out there, people are gonna see them down the road, they're gonna discover them through searches, and then they're gonna find them and repin them, and it sort of starts the exposure ball rolling all over again. So. Again, if you haven't been in and tested it yet, it's definitely worthwhile to go in and doing some testing. There's definitely some uh, differences between how you might do your targeting on Twitter or how you might do it on Facebook. But again, very worthwhile to get in and do a little playing around with. So the last thing I've got for you before we uh, switch over to do some Q&A, I'd like to wrap things up with some type of freebie. So if you have not yet heard of it, there's a free service out there called Pin Alerts. And what Pin Alerts does is it lets you enter a domain name and they will send you an email whenever content from that domain name is pinned. Now, people used to use this to track all of the content from their own site being pinned, but now that Pinterest has given us analytics and we can just go in and look at their data, it's not necessary on that front. But this can be a wonderful, wonderful tool for doing competitive research to find out what people are pinning off of your competitor sites or what they're pinning off of the sites that might be prospective clients that you don't have access to yet. Now, there are a few sites that it will not give you these reports for. Anything that's massively high volume, you know, Martha Stewart weddings, Better Homes and Gardens, they're going to give you a block on that. But anything that's not super, super high volume, it's a really great way to get in and gather some really great insights and information. And that's all I've got. So, Stacey, we can pop back over to you and do some Q&A. Thank you, Jennifer, for that. Great presentation. Um, right before we pop into those questions, I'd like to remind everyone that we're going to launch a really quick survey at the conclusion of the Q&A. Your feedback is very valuable to us, and we use that to determine our topics for future webinars and how we can improve them. So we would love if you could fill that out at the end. Um, we got a slew of questions, so let's see how many we can get to in this last 10 minutes or so here. Uh, the first one comes from Katie. When you were talking about average time on site, was that per day, per week, or per month? That was per month. That was 90 hours per month on Facebook. I'm sorry, uh, 7 hours per month on Facebook and 90 minutes per month on Pinterest. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Anne. So we talked about the female demographic on Pinterest and briefly about the male demographic. Uh, was there any data or insight onto what the male users were looking at? Um, the top categories for male users right now, actually the number one category for male users is geek. And then you go into technology, cars, uh, travel, and tattoos tend to be the ones that have the most visits. 
fantastic. The next question comes from Richard, and that is, do you have any thoughts on using the comments of pins as an interaction point? I sometimes thank pinners for sharing my pins. Uh, that's an excellent question, and that's one that I would like to see happen more in the world of Pinterest, but we just we don't see a lot of commenting taking place. And again, I think part of it is because people are in a different mindset on Pinterest than they are when they're on a site like Facebook where they're used to kind of having that back and forth engagement. So I've been watching it but for three years now, and there's been a mild uptick in the amount of comments that's taking place, but it's still pretty minimal. And I think part of it is you don't get the same notification coming in that tells you someone has commented on a pin that you do in Facebook. There's a way for that to show up, but it's not as intuitive and it's not as in your face. So I think a lot of times even when someone does leave a comment, it kind of gets lost in the mix. Now maybe at some point they'll realize that if they make that change and they make it a little bit more of a prominent feature, that there's a lot of better opportunity for businesses to really be able to get some good back and forth dialogue going. Absolutely. And I think you know, also part of it is just because when you're pinning, it's like a very fast and quick activity. Maybe users don't really think to comment on these posts like the way they would do on Facebook or Absolutely. Twitter or some of the other networks. All right. The next question also comes from Richard, and that is, do you have any advice for optimizing pin captions for discoverability? So should I be including hashtags, keywords, or phrases? Um, I would definitely go with keywords because remember people do run searches on Pinterest the same way that they would do on Google or YouTube or wherever. So generally, whatever keyword research is popping up for you, you know, really well as part of your SEO side, it's worthwhile to consider that when you're crafting your descriptions for your pins. I still personally avoid hashtags on Pinterest just because I, much like the comments, I just haven't seen a really strong adoption of them. You know, they, they rule the roost on Instagram. They do really, really well on Twitter. We even see them pop up on Facebook some. But I just don't see a high enough adoption rate for me to want to take up space sort of cluttering you know, my, my descriptions with uh, hashtags. So I tend to fo focus more on getting some of that sort of real language search terms into what I'm putting up as my description. Great. The next question comes from Doug, and that is, do you have a recommended rhythm or frequency for pinning and posting on Pinterest? I know you talked earlier about how the algorithm kind of prevents you now from flooding the feed of other people. So do you have a recommended rhythm? You know, that's, that's a great question, and one that I don't necessarily have an answer to right now because we're kind of trying to figure it out ourselves. You know, there was a point where you really wanted to pin at certain times of day or pin your best content at certain times of day because we could track really dramatic spikes in the repin based on when we put it out there. And then there was a time where Pinterest only showed like the first so many pins you put up a day, so we had to be really careful about that. And then I know scheduling tools started to pop up because you wanted to kind of mix it up a little bit. But now that Pinterest is kind of doing that mix for you, it doesn't seem to have as much impact to really worry about you know, how many pins you're putting up at a time or what time of day you do it. So I think some of that is it, that's going to be one of the things that we're all figuring out over the course of the next few months is we really look at how this new algorithm comes into play. And I think the best answer I can give you is to just do some testing and see what performs best. Awesome. And kind of along the note to that question, with those algorithm changes and this kind of weighting of content, um, you know, we see that you know, in some ways it's a great thing on Facebook, and in other ways it's kind of deterring users on Facebook. Um, how do you think this will affect Pinterest users? Do they want to see pins in chronological order from the people who are pinning them, or do you think that they prefer this kind of tailored algorithm with this better content? I think there's going to be a short, brief period where some Pinterest users are going, great, where's the rest of my content? I know there should be more here than that. But I think from my own experiences watching and talking to people, their algorithm is really doing a very good job of putting things in front of people that they're interested in. And I think if Facebook has proven anything to us, it's that no matter how many changes they make and no matter how much people grumble, as long as the results end up in a good usable experience, people are going to keep coming back to it. So I think we'll see a little bit of an adaption period, but I think people are ultimately going to accept it and probably end up embracing it. I think the bigger question on that front is as we see Pinterest introducing a true algorithm rather than simply putting things up as people pin them, 
are we going to see the same problems happen that we have with Facebook where we've reached the point that you know, organic reach is almost dead for the greatest majority of brands. I think I did a, did a presentation last month, and I think the number that I pulled was it's 0.07% is the average organic reach for the average brand online now. Now clearly the ones that are doing a great job are higher than that, but you know, those numbers are falling through the floor. So when we look at the timing of Pinterest introducing promoted posts and their algorithm all kind of at the same time, are we going to see a similar thing happen where as brands to kind of force our way in, are we going to have to rely on actually paying for those promoted pins instead of being able to get things into the DR cell? Definitely something as brands are going to have to look out for, but also encouraging that people are going to want to really embrace this type of relevant news that's going to come in their feed as a result of the algorithm. Right. Uh, the next question comes from Lynn, and that is, how precisely can I identify influencers or trends as a way to benefit my business? Should I be searching by topic in the Pinterest search bar? Um, I think that's a great starting point. Uh, when you go and you run searches on Pinterest, you can search for a pin as a whole, you can search for a board, or you can search for a pinner. Now, if you're going really broad, searching for a pinner can be effective. If you're looking for a fashion pinner or for a tech pinner or a journalist or whatever, that can work really well because it's going to look both at the content in their boards and in the description that they have in their account. But if you're looking into something that's maybe a little bit more of a nuanced topic, you know, if you're not just looking at fashion, but you're looking at you know, hair and nails, or you're looking at scarves, for that, I think you're going to want to search for an actual board. And you want to look at the boards to see how many followers do they have, how many pins are going out on that board, and then click into it and see, is the content consistently repinned? I mean, do they have like one or two pins that have just exploded, or is every pin they're putting out really receiving a lot of repents. And that starts to help you say, okay, this is a person that is influential in this particular topic because the person, you know, the fashion blogger that you approach for one product line might be completely different than who you want to approach for a different product line. And again, if we take that to geek or tech or whatever, it's going to be the same thing. The person who's a huge pinner on all things Apple related is going to be completely different than the person who's a huge pinner on Android gadgets. Absolutely, and that's really, really interesting. Um, it looks like we have time for a question or two more before we wrap up. So the next one's kind of interesting. It comes from Susan, and that is, what industries do you recommend not to post to Pinterest? I work for a B2B telecom company, and I'm trying to determine if Pinterest would be beneficial for us. Well, I think the, the two things to start off with that question are to go to Pinterest, and I'm, I can't remember the URL off the top of my head, but if you run a Google search for this, you can find it. There's basically a URL that you can put in that's got the little source tag, and you can add your website's URL to the tail end and see if any content from your website has been pinned. Because you would be amazed how often we talk to companies who think no one is interested in them on Pinterest, and we can go call that up and go, well, really? Because there's like 5,000 pins off of your site in Pinterest. And they're like, we had no idea. So that's a great starting point to say, is there an existing interest in our particular company? Now, if you don't find anything on that, then I think running some of those keyword searches and looking at both the pins and the boards to see are other people actively engaged in that content, I think that's your good starting point. The nice thing about being at the point where we've reached really solid saturation with Pinterest is for the most part, unless it's a brand new idea or concept, if it's not on Pinterest, you're going to have a little bit more difficult time to get the ball rolling on Pinterest. So if you can't find anything from any brand that's similar to what you have to offer, then it's probably best to say, we'll set Pinterest aside for now and put our focus in other places where we know we're really getting good traffic. Really, really excellent advice. Um, the last question we're going to take comes from Brian, and that is, limited time, capacity, and resources at a nonprofit. What is the top piece of advice you'd give to a nonprofit looking to direct users to a donation landing page? Um, I think for that it becomes a lot about the storytelling idea. Um, it's about using that board to really be pinning videos, articles, photos, you know, again, kind of going back to that idea of the same type of content that you might show on Facebook, but just in a higher volume. And if you have a blog for that nonprofit, 
where you're putting up, you know, news stories or, you know, clippings or whatever you're getting, making sure you're putting all of that content. I think that's a good starting point. But I'll be honest and say for the, I have a nonprofit um, that I run that that's what I'm doing the big event planning for now. We don't use Pinterest for our nonprofit as a traffic source. We use it as an idea generator. So as we're working on, you know, a gala or, you know, special fundraising event, we're going out to find ideas and inspiration and approaches and resources. And I have found personally that has far more value to me on that side than it does as a direct traffic source. Now, my nonprofit is a small nonprofit. If you're a much larger one, you know, if you're on the national scale, I think that storytelling idea and then pinning things that are just related concepts to what you have to do, I think that has some potential. But I don't think you're probably not likely to see quite as much success as you would if you had an outright you know, product line or service or something that people, again, want to collect as opposed to wanting to give. Awesome. Well, it looks like we are at the top of the hour, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending. That was a really, really information-packed webinar and an equally as packed uh, Q&A, so we do thank you for answering all of those questions. You can find an archive of webinars on our website at decision.com. Additionally, some excellent research and slides from webinars past can be found on SlideShare. That's slideshare.net forward slash Cision. And of course, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. We are Cision, a leading provider of public relations and social media software. We recently combined with Vocus and also represent the Gorkana Group, Visible Technologies, TR Web, Help Reporter Out, and iContact. Jennifer, thank you again for joining us.